when, we, when I looked down the, uh, the list of, of who was coming, you know, one should always try and uh, be person-centred, I believe, and give your audience what it is they need. And, and the expertise in the room around dementia is phenomenal. There are people who have probably been working at this job as long as I have in the room, and for others for whom dementia is, has touched them in their families, and uh, you know everything in between. So, in trying to sort of think what I would cover this evening, um, I put these things together. I'm going to tell you a bit about the Association for Dementia Studies. I want to take a, a look at numbers because that's always very important in dementia, but also um, to temper that by thinking a little about both age and about cohorts and some of the new data that we have out on, um, on the projections <coughs> around dementia. I'm going to touch on the business of health and social care and the future of, of, of that for dementia, and more particularly on dementia-friendly communities and maybe thinking about some opportunities there might be in the nostalgia business. Uh, for people with dementia who are very good at nostalgia, and for those of a certain age who are quite interested in nostalgia as well. And then uh, to finish up a bit on planning for our own futures. Um, I've got various acknowledgements outside society, Dementia Friends, Dementia Action Alliance, Dementia UK, everyhit.com, which might give you a few, few clues to what's coming up later. Um, also, the Oaks Pub in Ramsbottom that I visited last week. Sanctuary Care Group, because some of the things I'm going to talk about today uh, started at a, a, a discussion I had with their senior management team. And also, my team at the Association for Dementia Studies. Okay, I don't like this. I'm just going to... So I'm not leaving. Okay, the Association for Dementia Studies. I'm not expecting, this isn't an eyesight test, I'm not expecting you to read all this. This is, these leaflets are available on the stand at the back. What we tried to do is put everything we do on two pages and that was quite a, a, a challenge. But just to highlight a, a few things, um, we were only established in 2009. We're still a fairly new um, department within uh, within dementia studies and we've developed some very strong streams of work um, both on the research side and on the education side particularly around early interventions and primary care the whole issue of how we live well with dementia uh, we've done a lot of work in, in care homes and in supportive housing and also in hospitals those are our big those major major projects that we've <coughs> we this is our team this is our team in our core team in, in 2013 and you'll see from just me in 2009 we've grown phenomenally I can't even say that recuperate I can spell phenomenally <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think you know for those of you in the dementia Field, you'll know that the Dementia Strategy was launched in 2009 and our express aim was to try and provide the research and education support to the National Dementia Strategy. So we're very much lined up with what's going on at a, at a national level. And all of our funding um, initially started funding from the University of Worcestershire Local Authority and Primary Care Trust the Mind Post and a couple of others, but everybody else is funded either through our education programmes that, that we run or from uh, our research projects. We're a multi-professional group. I'm a clinical psychologist by background, but in our number uh, we have uh, a number of nurses, social workers, occupational therapists, gerontologists, people who uh, a lot of our staff have had previous careers working in health and social care and have moved into academia later on in their career. Um, but what we all share is a belief um, that if we apply ourselves to um, working at 
improving person-centred care for people with dementia, the world would be a lot better place. So our work isn't about medical research or finding the cure, it's about looking at how people with, living with dementia and their families can achieve a better life. So that's us. If you want more information, go on our website. It's fantastic, and we've got lots of information uh, at, at the back there. And if you take one thing away, take that away, because that's got it all. We call ourselves an association because if we are serious about providing um, uh, person-centred care and improving quality of life, we have to work in partnership with others. Um, so all of our education projects and research projects, obviously with health and social care providers, with commissioners, with the, the growing number of, of charity organisations in this sector. We work with other educational establishments through the Higher Education Network in Dementia, with other universities, so a lot of our research projects are actually multi center research projects and more recently um, we've had a, a project that's been evaluating um, the impact of, of doing dementia, education about dementia with school children so thinking about that generation coming up many of whom have got grandparents with dementia and uh, that's been a, a very rewarding and rich piece of work you know, looking at, at uh, working in schools a lot of work with government agency, particularly the DH. I must get invited to some think tank or other most weeks now. I sometimes wonder if ever the talking will then translate into practice, but you know, I still go along and, and bang on about the things that we find important here. And obviously hospitals, care homes and housing. And on our research side, we do a lot of commissioned research, so a lot of the research evidence around care in dementia. <coughs> it's people trying out new things and saying, hey, this really seems to be making a difference. So we do quite a lot of small-scale evaluative type research. But also now um, some large-scale research projects from the NIHR and the real feather in our cap just recently is we've just uh, been awarded a large-scale research project funded through the joint oh, program of neurodegenerative disorders, that's JPMD, uh, from, the, uh, from the EU, from the Economic, uh, from the European Union. Um, more about that one later. So we've moved, for us, working at a local and regional level is very important. So our partnerships with um, Health and social care, particularly in Herefordshire and Worcestershire, has been really important to develop uh, good ways of working. And I suppose from a purely selfish point of view, um, I have, uh, uh, I've got a lot of people with dementia in my family. I'm going to grow old here. I will probably get my dementia here. So I want to make sure that Worcestershire is the best place to get dementia. <laughs> <laughs> Herefordshire, we might move. You know. <laughs> And also central to our work is the experience of people living with dementia and their families informs the work of ADS at, at every stage. So we have a person with dementia and a, a family carer who sit on our steering group. People with dementia and family carers teach on all of our educational programs. And also as part of our research projects, we always have a person with dementia and a family carer as part of the steering uh, arm of that research. So in terms of person-centred care, it keeps us real in what really matters to people with dementia and their families. Okay, so why is <coughs> dementia everybody's business now? It's mainly the numbers. You know, I've worked in this field now, um, getting on for 30 years, you know, when I used to say that I worked in, with older people, mental health, that people would glaze over and, you know, you could see them thinking, well, why would you bother to do that as a psychologist and what's the point because they're old anyway, you know, those sorts of stereotypes were, were very prevalent. 
now when I say what I do, most people will say, oh, my mum's my got dementia, you know, my dad, my grandparents, my wife, my husband, you know. The numbers are now stacking up so that the, the vast majority of people, their lives will have been touched by dementia in one way, shape. And if we want a graphical representation of that, on the far side we've got um, around 800,000 people with dementia in 2012. By 2021 we're looking at a million, uh, a million people uh, with dementia in the UK. And by 2051 we're looking at, uh, at uh, 1,700,000. So you can see that the growth in numbers is, is quite staggering, uh, doubling um, in that from 2012 to 2051. And you might want to plot your own ageing along that line as well. Uh, certainly. And if we bring that down to more manageable numbers in somewhere like Worcestershire, um, these are the more recent figures we've got for Worcestershire on, on a similar time trajectory, we can see that the real big increase, and Worcestershire, the Deputy Mayor probably knows how many people have got, 500,000 citizens or so, so that's the sort of, uh, the sort of uh, numbers we're looking at. But the really big increases is in, in these two lines. So we know that as, in the, as the age bands go up, the prevalence of dementia increases. And because we are living a lot longer, which is great, we are living into that age band, though, when dementia becomes more prevalent. And certainly as you get into the 80 plus age band, dementia doesn't travel alone. You know, you're often, the, some statistics <coughs> would say, you know, in that, that 85 plus band, you've got probably between three and six other long-term conditions going on alongside your dementia. So it, it's, a, it's a complicated picture. It's a more complicated picture the older people get and the numbers uh, stack up. And it's not just our country. You know, if you look globally, <coughs> globally the numbers of people with dementia are expected to double every 20 years. So that's 24 million now to 81 million worldwide. Someone asked me a question earlier whether there was any country that didn't get dementia. Um, and as far as we know, not. There are, some, uh, there are some countries and parts of the world which seem to have slightly lower or slightly higher prevalence. But we're still looking, if, if you look at the age bands as they grow older, it's still, you're still seeing that increase in, uh, in, in numbers as, as people are. And also by 2040, 71% of people with dementia will live in low and mid middle income countries. So South America, Central Africa, um, India. You know, if, if you're looking at the ageing, where the ageing populations are really starting to expand, it, it, it's in those countries. And having been to an Alzheimer's Society conference in India, you know, and knowing what the, the lack of health and social care infrastructure there is for those very elderly people who've got dementia and other conditions, it may be very, it may be, uh, say I was never ever going to moan about our services here, you know, I think uh, globally, this is a global issue. Is it more complex than that? Those are the numbers and those are certainly the figures if you go to a, a, a government, uh, you go to the government website, those are still up there. The figures, those projections, um, certainly for the UK, mainly come from the, um, from the cognitive uh, function of ageing study that was carried out 1989 to 94. Um, and 
that they were they carried out baseline community surveys in six regions of the UK, and that then generates those figures. Yeah, so that's how, by a lot of complicated mathematics, we come up with that figure of, of, of 800,000. There's a recent <coughs> paper that's just been published online in The Lancet, um, which is CFAS2. So what they've done in CFAS2 in 2011 was to repeat the survey using the same survey instruments as the community survey in three of the original areas, so Cambridgeshire, Newcastle and Nottinghamshire. Now interestingly, if you do the sums from that more recent survey, it looks like our projected that the numbers of people in the other <coughs> 65 that have got to mention now is actually 670,000. So that's quite an interesting statistic. I've been, is that my phone? Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> Probably is. <laughs> um, yeah, it's gone. <laughs> It was on silent, but it's quite a loud silent. You could hear a pin drop in here when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> We've got all the commissioners saying, OK, so we can cut that bit now. Um, you know, a lot of complicated mathematics have been done around this. And, and uh, I have been invited to get another think tank of the Department of Health now to look at these new figures, because they have just come out. They're quite interesting. Um, and uh, what does that then mean? For us locally, should we start recalculating? You know, so these, these numbers are important. <coughs> Interestingly, though, the bottom line there, they also looked at the number of people with dementia in care settings. So 20 years ago, they a lot of continuing continuing care wards then rather than care homes. But that number has increased to 70%, 56% 20 years ago. So what we and if you look at the, the breakdown, this is a graph of it. So in blue, you've got what the situation was in this study 20 years ago. And in the, the sort of salmon in pink, it's the CFAS2 study. So you can see there's still that steep increase as you get, um, as you get into older age. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and it doesn't seem to be a particular age range that, that's, well, the older age range is getting it, you know, looks like it was less prevalent than it was 20 years ago. So what's that? So what we seem to have is this age versus cohort effect. So we haven't perhaps got the, you know, it's not that the older you get, the more <coughs> you get. But if you think about your cohort is the 10 years in which you were born. So it's your birth cohort. And it's not surprising that different cohorts age differently. You know, we have different experiences, different health, different lifestyle. So although sometimes we look at these figures and we think they're very static, actually a lot of them, the things that a lot of them are based on, um, you know, we, we need to be thinking cohort, I think, in dementia care as much as, as, as age. But it, what it looks like is that these later born populations seem to have a lower risk of prevalence of dementia than people who were born earlier in the last century. The question now is what? You know, what is it? Of course our health educationists will say it's because we, we've stopped that group stopped smoking, they're lower, you know, they're eating better, they're taking more exercise, all of those health education things that were, were in place have had a positive effect. Might be that. It might be the cohort difference due to early life experiences. So if you think when that group was born, it was during the 30s and 40s, 1930s, 1940s, rationing, you know, <coughs> quite a... Quite, a healthy, low-fat diet by today's standards. So was there something around in those early experiences that have meant that people have got now more robust brains as they get older? 
might be watching EastEnders three times a week has protected that generation <laughs> from, uh, from getting to mention mobile phones. We don't know. You know, what we know is there is a cohort difference. And I think now it's, uh, uh, it, it's thinking about what that cohort, why we're seeing that difference. If indeed it is a real difference, because I think there's, there's some interrogation that's got to be done of, of, of those figures. And also, I think what goes down could go up again. You know, if this is to do with diet, for example, now that we're seeing, you know, type 2 diabetes in younger people and more obesity, might we be seeing this going up again? You know, so that's the first message, really, is that think cohorts, don't just think age. And we need to, um, in terms of our health and social care business, that's quite an important thing. Okay. Also, over the last 20 years, you know, this huge shift in how we see dementia. When I first started, it's certainly the death that left the body behind, you know, this very nihilistic view about what dementia was. Um, and now, certainly, our, our, you know, the strap line of the National Dementia Strategy is about living with dementia. <coughs> National Dementia Strategy 2009, Prime Minister's challenge on dementia with the, the change in administration. A number of us were concerned that this would be the last government's thing, it wouldn't be this government's thing. But uh, certainly I think from a political point of view, dementia is here to stay. <coughs> it's business for the politicians. Um, and I don't just think they've recycled the the covers, and perhaps they had quite a few of them left at the Department of Health, but, um, but I think it was meant to signify that this was something that would transcend uh, different administrations and, and go forward. So we get the Prime Minister's challenge on dementia, driving improvements in health and care, the creation of dementia-friendly communities that I'm going to talk about, and also the need for the better research. And those three strands working together um, should bring about change. And dementia is business for politicians. You know, then big numbers are voters. So this is a, uh, I think, uh, obviously the prime minister is personally concerned about dementia. I've no doubt about that. But there is a there is a political imperative that, that drives this too. So much so, I love this picture. This isn't David Cameron brushing his teeth, i just like to say. This is on, on our dementia care courses that we've been running, um, particularly around hospitals. We always give out the RCN dementia pen, which is quite a flash pen. Uh, it's so flash that it might have been neat all the time, I don't have one anymore. Um, but we always run a competition for the member of staff who can get a picture of, oh, look, to show to everyone. See, it's got a banner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a competition because, you know, de dementia care is all about leadership in acute hospitals. So if you can get your picture, how high up the hierarchy can you get your pen? That's the competition, and yeah. at the end of it, if you've got a picture of it in the sort of chief executive's hand, you get the prize. Well, Jo Gray from Oxfordshire, district nurse, as she lives in the Prime Minister's constituency, rang him up, and he sent her a picture of him holding the pen. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been to number 10. Dementia-friendly communities, this whole, which I think is the, a, 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 a real shift in this, uh, in this last government is really about trying to ensure that we have great health and social care, of course, but that it happens within dementia-friendly communities. Um, and this work being led by Angela Rippon, engaging with businesses, an awareness-raising campaign across the country, and we have a number of cities, villages and towns that now would call themselves dementia-friendly. Dementia Friends Network, um, website, the ambition is to have a million dementia friends by 2015. If you, you can become a dementia friend by doing a one hour awareness session. I'm looking to see whether anybody has a dementia friends badge on. Yes, there you go. Oh, you've not got yours. You have to, oh, there you go. 
Dementia <laughs> friend man. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you do your awareness session, you get a badge, and you make a pledge of commitment. Um, the awareness sessions are run by Dementia Champions, and we also have Dementia Champion on the front row. Um, they have one day training to allow them to, to, to run the Dementia Friends uh, Champion training, awareness rather. And they're open to all comers. So you can do a Dementia Friends, you can become a Dementia Friend in any walk of life. And the thing that you pledge will depend on who you are, I guess. So if you're a journalist, you might make a pledge to stop using ageist language in your writing. My pledge was to look at making the University of Worcester a dementia-friendly university. You know, so it's within your own sphere of, of, of influence. Dementia Action Alliance, um, again, started from the DH and the uh, um, Alzheimer's Society. Started with 43 members. It now has, um, this is the latest report, 106 national members and 46 local members. And, you know, the, the members are a lot of health and social care providers and royal colleges, but also uh, places like the Rotary Club and, uh, you know, the uh, Saga Home Care. What else have we got? You know, the, the, the uh, lots of different people, ASDA. You, so if you are part of, if you're part of the Dementia Action Alliance, you make a, 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 an action plan which says how you will support people um, are against these seven quality outcomes. So we have an action plan. You can read anybody's action plan on the, the Dementia Action Alliance website. So again, an important national awareness uh, and commitment. But I suppose in terms of our health and social care business, these are simple outcomes, but dementia is a complex set of disorders. You know, and I try again to put that down on one page here. It covers a complex range of different syndromes, of Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer's uh, syndrome, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and as, w as well as some really, really rare dementias. They often happen to people who are also experiencing other health and social care changes at the same time. And, you know, often we say that dementia is like the new cancer, you know, in terms of the, 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 the now I'm talking about it and, and, and stigma. But actually, if you think about what our health and social care services aim to do around dementia, it's a lot more complicated than in cancer. Um, we aim to support people and their families through this very long pathway uh, around, around their journey with dementia. And all of that needs to be done with due respect and sensitivity to that person's lifestyle, their family context, and the context of the community in which they live. This is a complicated ask. It's not something that's going to be fixed by a million dementia friends. You know. the dementia friends are great, but we need to also have the, the very robust health and social care um, at the same time. And often when we're teaching about this, we use the metaphor of a, of a river to say that there are, you know, we think the person with dementia and their family are in that boat. They're steering their way down this complicated river. There are times when we know there will be rocks, and times, of, certainly after diagnosis, when we know often people will say it's like, that's a life-changing diagnosis, like full, going into free fall. We know that there's rocky patches when, people's pers when people start needing help with personal care, or when people start need uh, admission to hospital. And we need this expert team who all know what they're doing if that boat needs to come out of the water. You know, you're a hospital team dealing with somebody with dementia. You need to get it right, and you need to get it right quickly. And what we're trying to do with our dementia, with dementia, is to steer people into those calm waters. And I think this is a challenge for us, you know, if it's everybody's business, we have to make sure that it doesn't become nobody's responsibility. And I think that's a, a real risk with dementia.
future. It needs all of this to work together, really. You know, if we think about that boat hitting rocks, a lot of that is about health. It's about timely diagnosis, recognising comorbidities, making therapeutic <coughs> interventions, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological, getting the specialist support in a crisis, working with people who've got difficult histories, doing comp specialist care with complex families, and recognising that there's always more than one person in that boat. There's a whole family that will be impacted by dementia. So if we're in healthcare, primarily, that's what our business is about. Then there's the navigating that river, which it, you know comes down to our specialist social care. It's providing that good quality care that supports the whole family to carry on and not get overwhelmed. It's about information, <coughs> education, finances, legal advice, signposting, technology, adjustments, giving support, giving hugs, doing some counselling, getting peer support, people talking to each other, getting a break, getting help at home, care homes, extra care. Meeting DEM is the uh, project that we got the JPMD funding for. This is um, a group of, a service that was developed in the Netherlands, 90 meeting centres based in the community that are specially geared up for people with dementia and their families who are living at home to provide that that bit in the middle, but to give it a, a, a physical focus. <coughs> We've lost a lot of our daycare, you know, and I'm not saying that we should go back to traditional daycare, but that focus of somewhere where people can get care. And clean and calm waters, that's the dementia-friendly communities, you know, where dementia isn't stigmatised, where people with dementia and their families can use the same facilities as everybody else, where they have equal rights as citizens, where you can have fun, you can have a family life, schools, businesses, employers, churches, temples, mosques, all of them making, a, making that river clearer for people with dementia. <coughs> okay, nostalgia business and then I'll finish. Nostalgia is important, you know, I've got two photos here, one of, taken of a, a group of friends in the 1980s and another taken of me and my friends in when we were all having our 50th year. You know, and for all of us thinking about who we are in our mind's eye. You know, all of us who got tarted up for our 50th, probably in our mind's eye, we were all still the hip chicks that we were in the 1980s. <laughs> you know, we, all of us carry around an image of what we like, you know, and it rarely accords to, uh, to, to what, we, what other people see of us. And that's important in dementia, because that becomes even more so in dementia. If we think about many dementias are about not being able to keep track of what's happened most recently. So what happened to us, particularly in our teens and twenties, becomes our identity. That's an identity that we can connect with. And this guy here, probably one of the most um, famous men that had dementia, developed dementia in his 70s and 80s. Some of you will know who he is. That's Ronald Reagan. In his dementia, went back to his life when he was an Illinois lifeguard. You know? So you might think, great, we'll get Ronald Reagan in our care home because we'll know what to do because we know all these, we've seen his films and he's got, you know, he's been president. But even that those were very significant memories, his memories were about this time. And if we can capitalise on that, you know, using <coughs> objects, photos, music and dance to stimulate those memories that are really there, not only is that an enjoyable pastime if you've got a dementia, it's probably quite an enjoyable pastime for most of us at a certain age. And I often do a, a, a exercise with care staff, you know, we take people's date of birth, but think about when you were aged 15 to 25, because that's your identity <coughs> cohort, that's your nostalgia cohort. So if you were born in the 1950s, the internet is a wonderful thing, you can go on and download the top 10 tracks from every year, 
These were the top five in the 1970s, and my guess is for those of you who were born in the 50s, you probably know every word to every one of those songs. <laughs> and some of the dances as well. <laughs> 1980s. <laughs> 1990s. <coughs> so let's think about our early 65s. You know, when were they? So if you were born in the 1910s, 1930s are your tunes. I'm interested in Minnie the Moocher. That's, what I, that's a new one I'm doing. <laughs> But of course, the beauty of the internet is you can download all these from iTunes or, or Spotify or, or, or whatever. 1940s, 1950s, and for some of you this will be getting tremendously close, <laughs> you know, 60s. And if we're thinking about our own 65s now, this is, the, this is their cohort. So again, it's this issue of cohort. You don't suddenly like start liking Max Vibros when you reach 80, if, you, if this is your age count. <laughs> and it got me to thinking about, uh, you know, nostalgia business opportunities. This is the Oaks in Ramsbottom. This is a lovely pub sign that I saw at the weekend. It doesn't look dated. It's, it's, it's a town like Bromyard, you know, there's that sort of Lots of empty pubs in the day. Need time to relax? Want to go shopping? Need time to yourself? Leave your husband with us. You only pay for food and drink. I mean, imagine if there was a dementia friends badge on that. You know, and imagine if on a Tuesday afternoon it was the Elvis Presley afternoon, and on such and such, and we had a pub quiz that was all about the 1970s that people would know. Do you know what I mean? It's that. If you can start building that in to pubs, restaurants, cafes, hotels, spa breaks, tea dances, dinner dances, you know, and then you've got personalised TV streaming and radio, you could really build some really good, supportive, fun things for people to do. Of course it's more complex, I'm not going to talk about all of this lot. But if you want to ask me any questions about this, I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk about the dementia friends experience in Japan. Um, and what I would say is, you know, we need to invest in health and social care at the same time to underpin this. That river, that lovely river, is no good unless we have build, boat builders, repairers and, and navigators as well. You know, so. Uh, what we should do. Okay, I think I'm going to finish there um, because let's uh, let's finish with uh, uh, thinking about good times. Okay, well, thank you. Sounding word. 
Um, so they changed the name into something like you know, cognitive disorder <coughs> later life. So that, that part of the dementia friends stuff was about getting that new term into society. And it's certainly been very successful from that point of view. But my psychiatrist friend said, you know, the people that have made most money out of this have been the Chinese medicine people. Because now everybody is trying to take a drug or, or, or a herb or something to stop them getting dementia. You know, and I think it comes on to my sort of fourth point. I don't want to decry Chinese medicine at all. But when you create um, an awareness around dementia, it doesn't necessarily mean that people stop being frightened of it. And if people are frightened of it, they will try lots of weird and wonderful things to try and get rid of it. You know, so in that vacuum, we need to be aware um, of making sure we've got an evidence base or a strong reason for recommending that. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm John, they, your figures uh, suggested that uh, there's going to be a great growth in the number of people getting dementia, but we've got a better understanding now of the causes of uh, cancer and it's growing all the time. Uh, our knowledge is and leads to better interventions. Won't that be the case <coughs> with our knowledge around dementia as the uh, as scientific uh, thinking and uh, discovery gets better? Yeah, it should be, you know, that, uh, but I think, you know, going back to the Prime Minister's challenge, if you look at the amount of funding that goes into dementia research, it's pitifully small compared to what goes into to heart disease and, and, and cancer. Um, you know, and I go to a lot of conferences around trying to understand the early signs of dementia, and um, You've got a, a lot of different disorders, a lot of different disease pathways going on there. It's, it's not a clear-cut <coughs> trajectory. Um, there are some promising treatments coming up, but in terms of getting them into society, and it actually, if we get a drug tomorrow, we're probably still looking at 20 years before it makes much of a difference. <coughs> and the key treatments, if you're looking at uh, drug treatments for dementia, you'd probably be having to have them before you get the clinical signs of dementia. You know, so if you look at, if by the time you start getting symptoms, you've probably already had that disease process going on for 20 years, you know, but at a sub symptom level. So it's really complicated stuff. Any other questions? Long student to Lawrence Burton is um, one of the research trustees, and I think he's going to do a photograph. Do I sit down for a moment? Thank you. Thank you.